Hello everyone, I'm Eddie Brill. I'm the host of OG Talk OG for Organic Grill. I'm my co-host, the owner of the Organic Grill, the great Vlad Grinberg, the VG of OG. Um, his incredible restaurant's been here for a couple of decades in the East Village. Um, our guest today, John Joseph, another Finally. gentleman from the, uh, the East Village, uh, lives in the, whoa, the neighborhood. Whoa. Lower Not East a, Side, please, don't a, say East Village. Yes, the Lower East Village side. Um, <laughs> we're, on the, we're putting it all together. I moved here in 1980. Uh, you were here before. Uh, when, when did you first get here? I started uh, coming to Alphabet City, 76, 77. Right, and it's funny, Alphabet City. Traffic and City, drugs. Alphabet City was traffic and drugs. That's well, you know what they used to say. What's that? If you went to Avenue A, you were adventurous. B, you were bold. C, you were crazy. D, you were dead. <laughs> e, you're in the East River. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that. See yeah. what you learn every day here. And then all of a sudden, you know, I lived on the corner of First Avenue, so that was like the border. That was the demilitarized yeah, zone. Yeah, that was the DMZ right there, mm -hmm. First back, Ave. Back then. And now the East Village has changed. How, did, how do you feel about the, the new glorified... Uh, it's like one big fucking frat party out of here. Yeah. I mean, you know, even last week, these dudes just decided on a fucking, like, Thursday night to sit on my stoop and have a bunch of beers and fucking make a mess and talk shit while I'm trying to sleep. And I'm like, I'm like, yo, guys, can you go somewhere else? They're like, fuck you, calm down. I'll kick your ass. I came yeah. down with a fucking baseball bat and my hundred pound pit bull and uh Yeah, the asses well, were quiet as a church mouse. Exactly politically correct, yeah. Right. Yeah. The asses are on the other foot, so to speak, <laughs> in, in that situation. On St. Mark's where I live, the people don't realize that people live there. Yeah, I mean actually when uh I was uh got in trouble, seventy eight to eighty I was locked up, then I went in the navy, but I had to split from the navy. I caught a, a drug case smuggling sold to undercovers and beat someone up on my ship and I split. I came back to New York. So the first place I stayed, I squatted on St. Mark's between first and second. Uh -huh. There was abandoned buildings. That's and crazy. And I, I lived in a fucking empty apartment on that block, like with this crazy <laughs> dude, Papo. And every morning he was this black, he walked around with Kung Fu shit on. He's like, you can stay here, but you gotta come on the roof and you gotta train with me in the morning. And every well, morning great. I had to go up to the roof and do Kung Fu with this crazy motherfucker. And little down the road, you was like, well, you know, I, where's Papo? I could use a partner in the yeah, morning. Yeah, I saw him a few, uh, few years ago. I heard he passed away. Yeah, the, uh, the neighborhood, you know, the, the interesting is a lot of musicians on the street playing, and you just hope that they're good when they're shit. It's like you wanna, you know, if you're going to play on St. Mark's Place, you better be good. Because I've seen the, some pretty talented people out there, though, that deserve a gig better than some of these bullshit people that are getting record deals. Right. You do you know, remember Shanae? In the subway. And do you remember Shanae on uh, uh, St. Mark's? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Beck used to stand out front and hand out his poetry and say for a dollar for poetry. So there, this neighborhood is amazing yeah, I mean, for the talent. like me and Michael Alago, uh from the documentary, you know, who the fuck is that guy? Legendary right. dude in the music business. Uh, which you probably want to get him on, man. He's... Oh, yeah. 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 But uh, we, we, we went over here and uh, to the Basquiat uh, exhibit the day it opened at the new building they put up, uh, they fixed on 6th Street. And, uh, you know, it was the same thing. He used to say... I, you know, it wasn't my circle, like the art shit, but I would be in Max's in the 70s and 80s and... CBGB's or Haraz, and you would see, you know, Basquiat and Andy Warhol and fucking Keith Haring later on, and all these guys, Clemente. Yes. But like Basquiat, when he was going through, I would see him down copping and shit on Second and C, and he would be like selling poems and shit, poetry, uh, selling, uh, I'm sorry, uh, artworks right. that he did in sketchbooks for money to get a bundle of dope. And actually, Michael told the story that, uh, he was living in some woman's basement when he was really bad, and he tried to sell Michael this, uh, he tried to give him a sketchbook just for being his friend. They went to school together. and Really? Where'd they go to school? Uh, somewhere in Brooklyn. Oh, Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, Michael showed me on the wall, and those same sketches were there in little f frame photos. Twenty-two fucking million dollars for the collection. Wow. That's but Michael good. didn't take it because he's like, I'm not going to take that from you because you're not well right now and I'm not going to take advantage. 
But uh, yeah, that neighborhood. Yeah. Now you you were starting to bring up the fact, and I cut you off, and I wanted to talk about it. Like, yeah. Um, the the cutoff was when you were starting to talk about there are people in the subways. New York City is a, a city where, you know, as a talent, you have to sometimes go in the subway. You yeah. sometimes have to go on the roof and play and and have judo. Yeah. Well, you know, coming like you know, I have a lot of history in the subway because I was I was a kid on the streets from '76 to '78. So in the winter times, I would sleep in the subway. But then it got so fucking dangerous, like. You know, I, I, cause I was using, so I would wake up, fucking pockets cut open, all my shit gone, and then murders were happening in the subway. So like, you know, then I moved to the porno theaters, sleeping in there. On all you had to do was use a mop and uh, yeah, and but clean up. Uh, what you would do was you you would try to get the most sleep possible. So I was living in the beach in Rockaways. And so uh, I would take I would take the A train all the way from Rockaway uh, to 207th Street and then back. So you got like you got a couple hours. Yeah, in you there. got like three three and a half hours of sleep. But you know the subways were very very dangerous uh, back in the day, and uh, now you get um, you get your occasional motherfucker throwing some money on the tracks. But it's a lot. I like that they let the musicians. I always support them. I'm a musician uh, still to this day. So, you know, seeing people come out and you, you see some real talented people in the subway, like crazy skills. There's this one old jazz singer. He's usually up by Times Square and I'm like, you know. Yeah, you go to incredible. Washington Square Park. Like I was there on Sunday morning and some guy was just playing the sax and it was just a beautiful morning. You just heard this, like this beautiful refrain and you just close your eyes and say, this is New York. Yeah. This is what it's all about. Yeah. Like, but, that's, that was, uh, it's a different, it was a different vibe. Like, I always said, especially down here, too, like, the danger and the art ran on parallel tracks, you know? It was very fucking dangerous, but Well, they probably also, fed each other. The, yeah. And some people, like I said in my book, the, the evolution, I'm like, some people crossed into that other world, myself included for a little while, but... Uh, but you learned the difference. Yeah. You learned the difference because your life was full of sort of, you know, stuff where you were more into... Uh, you became a monk at some point in your life. 82 and, to 84. Right, you became a monk. So Rody all of for a sudden, the bad brains, so you, you're, 80 to 82. You're sleeping in the subway one, uh, four years earlier, and next thing you know, your, your life has changed and it's gone 180 yeah. degrees the other direction. Yeah. What, what, what was your mindset when you were a monk and how did you change from the well, sex and drugs and rock and roll guy to that's bullshit guy? Well, it was, it was, we had to backtrack a little bit because I, I came out of the military. I was a mess. I, I met the Bad Brains in Norfolk, Virginia in 1980. And, you know, prior to that, even 1980, my ship pulled into Montego Bay, Jamaica. Right. So they always show the videos on the mess deck. You know, if you're going to be with a prostitute of the country, you know, this is Jamaica. This is where you're going. Uh, mm. You know, uh, uh, you know, if you're going to use a prostitute, uh, you know, use a condom. Watch out for the crime. And under no circumstances do you have any interactions with these people. And they showed. <laughs> A Rasta with like smoke coming out of it. I'm like, that's the first That's my friend. <laughs> well, see, I was smuggling. So I smuggled Quaalude bags of Quaaludes, cocaine from Florida, because you didn't have dogs coming on the ship. There was no customs. So if you got it. But you told me about it. There was a guy who looked out for you. Yeah, there was a master at arms on my ship who I kicked back drugs and, and money. So they let me know, okay. When they started bringing the dogs in Norfolk, okay, yo, it's every fifth person. If I nod and you're coming up the fucking gangplank, don't slip back. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like so. So in Jamaica, I met this roster because I was I brought back three pounds of lamb's bread. They they uh, put it inside the statues for me, but mm -hmm. they started hipping me to the Itaw. Right. You know, like that's what they call it down that there. Was the but food. I was a hamburger eating motherfucker. Well tell people what Ital is, I know what it Ital is. Ital is vital, low tal is fatal. So Ital is like the purest vegan, no oil, no salt, like really uh, clean uh, plant based food, all organic. 
And, uh, and, and before then, that wasn't part of your world. Nah, I was a meat. I was still a meat and potatoes head. I, he tried to let me taste some kalaloo and shit and seaweed. I was like, that shit's fucking nasty. But the seaweed That's because was, your taste buds yeah, were different. Yeah, well, that's what happens. You change, and then even like later, I met the Bad Brains, and then I split, and I was working for them at uh, 171, and uh, HR was like, you know, you. So can't. what was so special about? Like your life was definitely chaos before. What was so special about Bad Brains and the music? I, you know, like when you saw them play, it was just like the most incredible uh, energy coming off the stage. And I met them when they were still punk rock, but just getting into Rastafari. Mm -hmm. This dude, this Dread Ray Chenner from Jamaica was the original one that hipped them to the whole shit. And uh, so they started bringing this real militant vibe and fuck Babylon and don't eat Babylon food. They're trying to kill you. And so. And again, but Babylon the, food is the... The poison the, that they're feeding the, the masses standard now, American like diet yeah, standard American diet, fast food, meat and potatoes, all this bullshit. And how did these guys know what to eat? It was from the only Ray Chinna. Like Ray Chinna was, you know, Ital Rastafari and still to this day. And he was a musician, so like uh, they, they kind of uh, started learning from him and their sound man, the late Jay Dubs was a white Rasta and he was up on like the raw foods, the Ital, right. the real shit. So when I got to move into 171 with them and that happened cause I fought this gang and got stabbed, but All nobody right. would stand up to them and I did. And you they got put the a KOS on me. Yeah, that, yeah, well, you know. Yeah, kill on that's, sight. Yeah, yeah, that's what happens. That's, you know, like to me, I'm like, yo, I came out of two years in the worst lockups in New York. I'm like, why ain't these motherfuckers fighting these guys that are walking up and slapping them in the face? I'm like, fuck that. So the dude tried to stab me, blocked it, ba bam, put him down, fought the other three or four dudes with a chain and got respect, but got to live with the bad brains. But, you know, the stipulation was no drugs, no alcohol, no meat. And, so, well, and they were definitely not just musicians for you. They were like mentors. Oh, no, they were like, HR is like a sadhu, man. Like, for real. And like what's when a sadhu? I mean, like a, a spiritual kind of dude who walks the path and renounced and just not of the worldly shit. He doesn't give a fuck about all of this. He didn't do music to get record deals and all this bullshit that mm -hmm. you've seen come later on. He loved what the fuck he was doing. And yeah. it wasn't about... Fame, adoration, distinction, money, fans. Yeah, because he had that's one all, purpose. That's all a byproduct. It's the actual work. That's what corrupts people. Everybody's, I, 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 I said in my book, most musicians are assholes waiting to happen mm. because everybody's humble and nice and yeah, the fans, this and that, when they're struggling. Let's see what happens when the shit starts coming in. How, and I've seen even my own band members in the Crow Mags flip yeah, on a fucking and That's dime. actually John's theory. Like, don't, don't uh, check on people when, when things go down, right? Check when everything is goes well. After you know, you know, people say, oh, you know your friends are when you're down in the dumps. I'm like, nah, motherfucker. No. Wait till you're doing good, and then the haters will come out of the woodwork. That's how you know who your friends are. Your well wishes that want you to succeed. And I want everybody to succeed. That's what I wrote even in my, the PMA effect. I'm like, I hope everybody. The problem is we live in a microwave society where everybody thinks, I'm going to put a fucking YouTube video up. I'm going to be fucking, uh, you know, I'll get a fast, bunch fast, of views fast. and fucking stop paying me. Okay, it's well, like, that's and the, the world we live in. Nobody wants to do the work. All right, so let's talk about that other world, the world where, like I said, you all of a sudden you went from the streets and you're now in this, uh, you're a monk. Um, and then you started learning about different people, and I, I'm sorry if I would get a name wrong, but it's one of the people that I've read in your Prabhupada. Prabhupada. Oh, well, Prabhupada, Prabhupada came from India in a long line of teachers going back thousands and tens and thousands of years. Uh, the Sampradaya. How did you first hear about him? Was it? Well, I'm going to tell you. You know what's funny? Because like I was in the military, and every weekend I would go up to fucking. DC and hang with Ian McKay, Henry Rollins, the whole DC punk scene up there and go to the shows. 
So the Hare Krishnas used to chant on Wisconsin Avenue, and we would like be all punked out, dance, making fun of them, but we were always respectful. And one time these like fucking uh, rednecks started like getting in the middle, like some Christian motherfuckers, like okay. with their dogmatic bullshit, like trying to get all. And we're like, and I was like, yo, back the fuck up, dude. He's like, what? You know these? I said, yo, they ain't bothering you. Step the fuck up. Well, according to philosophy, when you do one percent of any kind of service to the to the devotees, you, you, that's where you pick up from. So then I got a job at, at uh, I was AWOL, and I was living with the Bad Brains. We went down to DC, and I got a job at this health food store called Fields of Plenty. And then the dude Major, big brother with dreads, it was like a co-op health food store. He used to go to the Christian temple every day and get the food, and then he would bring it back. And I was like, yo, that shit tastes dope. And I'd be stealing <laughs> some of his shit every day for like two weeks. After two weeks, he comes with an extra container. He's like, I brought you food today. Now you can stop stealing my food. Like, he knew the whole time. Right, but he, he was probably happy that you were doing it. Yeah, and, and then it just continued. Yeah, because if you eat the food, it's the food is called prashadam, and they chant mantras over it. Like, it purifies you. So then the next thing was... I came back up to New York and I got a job at Prana Foods. So the drummer, you want to talk about punk rock, was from the Dots. Yes, sir. Jimmy yeah, Quid, we... Vinny Segnarelli, uh, and Jimmy Quid produced the first, uh, the first Bad Brain single, Pay to Come right. and Stay Close to Me. So HR was like, yo, this is Vinny and, and he's the drummer for the Dots and we met. And uh, apparently, like, the dude who was working there didn't show up. He's like, yo, we need somebody. I was looking for work. So they gave me a job at a health food store. So then every day we started having, and I was already going to Krishnamurti, St. Ram Das books, reading all this, these philosophy books. And, we, you know, Vlad and I saw the change in you recently. We were having a conversation uh, about some people who are doing you wrong, and you were very gentle with it as opposed to you well the, 10 the years ago yeah, and got composed put like i was impressed i well, said that it's my know, biggest I'm lesson still dealing with it but it's like you know it, it's uh you can't write a book about a positive mental attitude and then go fucking up everybody that i mean you that, can but you're not you doing can, it. that's how most of the people do but you are very very you're focused right to well, what you, know, you say uh, it's I've definitely come a long way especially my anger like I'm writing this film based on my first book The Evolution of a Cro-Magnon and because of what happened to me as a kid in the foster homes and my mother abandoning me and being on the streets and just a young kid and dudes just thinking y'all Yo, you're gonna take advantage of me so there was always this anger like and violent nature that I had that's yeah not to brag but that's why I developed a little bit of a of a, of a reputation down here in Alphabet City as a matter of fact the other morning I was walking at six o'clock the dog on the river at the projects down there and this dude goes yo that's a dope dog so I let Bear come over and he's like yo I know you I was like yeah I'm from I've been down here a long time he's like yeah man Turns out he knew all the dudes. I had beef with all the gangs. So, uh, you know, you just see, you know, you know your past is always, you It's know. there. And then it, I saw some other dude who was like, used to be in the music scene. He's all fucking strung out now. And But, you know, you, ha you have to learn uh, your lessons and keep your, keep your composure. And, well, you know, a lot of people are influenced by you. Uh, and, of course, you... Are become very humble or were humble and now it's out in the open. I'm the most humble. Yeah, I'm the humblest. I'm the humblest <laughs> yeah. of the humble. Yeah. I have the hum humblest of the humble. I have hummels at home. I have a whole uh, tray of them. And I want to go back to Prabhupada now that I know how to pronounce okay. it. Because this guy represents to me who you've become or the sort of a mentorship that he well, yeah, Acharya means one who leads by example, That's right. what, and that's what Prabhupada was. Prabhupada came here on the order of his teacher in India to spread the Vedic science, Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Sutras to the right. West. Right, and that's ba Every, and Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Gita. Bhagavatam, the Ishapanishads. You, he's, he's in the Guinness World Book of Records. No, and his Longest books, name that you can pronounce. His A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai. Right. But right. his books are in Harvard, all the universities in the philosophy the sections. 
And, and the thing it's is, the is Vedic, like Vedic science. Vedic, yeah. Vedic he, science. he came down here. All the other gurus were going to Park Avenue, and all in the rip, uh, the rich lap of luxuries and all this stuff. Prabhupada came from India, seventy years old, from India, right? To the, to the Lower East seven. Side, with nothing, seven dollars in a case of books. That's what he had. Imagine being seventy years old and going to a foreign country, and you come down here in the, in, in the 60s, 67. But his purity was the force. That's what made everything, uh, you know, that's how he had all the success that he had. So immediately he was going to Tompkins Square Park and chanting by the tree. There's a plaque there. It's a city landmark now. But Allen Ginsberg, all the Abby beat Hoffman, poets, Hoffman. like all these hippies and everything at the time started chanting with him and Allen Ginsberg got him a storefront so he can cook and he would sit there and, 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 and cook for people, serve people and before he would even eat one grain of rice, he, he cleaned everything and made sure everybody was satisfied. The, the, the personification of humility right. and knowledge. He's the humblest. Yes, the most humble. <laughs> the most humble. But just reading his books, because I said to Vinny, I, I kept challenging him philosophically and he would just kept defeating me and I was like, yo, where, where do you, where'd you learn all this shit? And he's like, I go to the Krishna temple every morning. So he said, you want to go one morning, let me know. And I was like, yo. So I went, I went to the temple and it was like, George Harrison plays on, played bass on this one song when they do this ceremony. It was just the most, the flowers and the incense and like, you know, it was just like a, sensual spiritual experience overload i was like wow did something like that happen or did yeah it, happen it was just time? like i was already i was already vegan raw foods i was working at integral yoga institute meeting victorious kovinskis yeah Victoria survival kovinskis survival into the 21st century one of the greatest books ever yeah i i mean i had that book and wigmore they used to do seminars so i would go to all the seminars because i did i did uh bhakti yoga in their kitchen i cleaned the pots right. i was learning how to cook yeah, these are Lithuanians uh, and Wigmore and... Yeah, uh, and, uh, Hippocrates Vic Health Center. Uh, that's where I went. And when yeah. I first went to Hippocrates, I, the first person I met was this guy, and he seemed really nice. We sat together, we ate, and then people... You know, I just thought he was some guy who was trying to get healthy. And uh, somebody goes, you know who that was? That's Victorious Kovinskis. And I said, oh. the, the most humblest, humble, yeah. humble Tonian. Yeah, I went to uh, his seminar, but uh, coming out of the temple, I was like, wow. And Vinny Signorelli said to me, he goes, Krishna's going to show you that this is the truth, mm -hmm. right? So I'm like, all right. What well, did you, you think know. at first? Were you cynical? No, I was blown away. No, okay. I was like, wow. Like, I kept going back and trying to defeat the devotees philosophically, and, and, and they were just like, it wasn't possible, you know? And, I mean, that's, it wasn't... It wasn't like in a chat. It was like, you know, this is what people defeat. used to do thousands of years ago. Philosophers would discuss philosophy and, and you know, all of this type of stuff, which is becoming, you don't see none of that shit nowadays. We used to sit around even in the old days in 171A and talk philosophy for hours on end. And the thing was, I was like, yo, this is the philosophy that leaves no stones unturned. I'm like, wow. They had analogy after analogy, and I was just like, wow. But it's also important uh, from what I read about and what you told me that it became part of your family. Like you always yeah. had dinners together, something that you never yeah, had, dinners, right? Yeah, that was, uh, that was going on too in the whole right. time. And I just talked to Doc yesterday, the guitar player for the Bad Brains. It was his birthday, and he was going out with his wife, his ex-wife, Lisa. And I was like, yo, man. And Doc goes, remember them dinners we used to have at, 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 on Avenue B? And I was like, yo, that was like, because I never, I, you know, six years I, I spent in this abusive foster home, I never sat down to one single meal with this family. We had to live in a garage, eat in a, in, out on the patio, like dog food. Not as a part of a family. Yeah, right? it was like. We were the outsiders that they were just taking the money. They never even took, it occurred to me, they never even took one picture of us the whole time we were there. We were like the ghost children. And uh, now I'm like, you know, the, the scene that I got brought into, this Bad Brains thing, it was like this family, the camaraderie, like I would have, and, and I did, like, you know, 
would risk my life to protect those dudes because that's what I did, you know. And also your uh, uh, Krishna friends, they all come in here and you treat them like your family, yeah. like Chris and everybody yeah, you, yeah, you ever just, came in with. Yeah, yeah. They're like uh, part well, of your Chris, family. Chris, we go way back. Yeah. We were like monks together. Right. He's, he's an amazing cat, man. And the thing was, uh, Vinny said, Krishna's going to give you a sign to show you this is the real deal. So I, I, I was trying to, I, I was, it, this was like the beginning of 81, and, and I would bring my mother organic groceries and shit out to Queens, Jackson Heights. She was throwing most of the shit away, but the point is I go into 74th and Roosevelt, and there's this Hare Krishna man comes right up to me, and I'm like, you know, and we get into this discussion. He he uh, he's trying to sell me a book. I was like, you should just give it away. Why are you right. why are you trying to sell it? It's spiritual knowledge. He's like, no, it's about you surrendering, you doing a little devotional service. I was like, well, I don't have any money. I said, how about a bottle of juice, organic juice? He's like, okay. So he gave me that book, and it was the science of self realization. And I'm like, I go to my mom's. I come back. I'm like, Vinny, you're not gonna believe this. <laughs> I show him the book, yeah. and he's like, I told, I told you. you. Yes. Things yeah. didn't work out working with the Bad Brains, and like a few months after that, I was, uh, I was living as a monk. I just gave it. I was like, you know, I got to do some healing on internal work. So I went to Puerto Rico, then I went to Hawaii Did for a year. Did you go to Wigmore in, Hawaii, in Puerto Rico? Nah, we were up in the mountains in like uh, Carajo, Right. In, in, uh, it's uh, right across from El Yunque. Curabo, we were, the temple was up there. And like the shit was like, it was crazy because you got there and everything was all peaceful. And then the next morning I started hearing this, in, these animals screaming. And there was a pig slaughterhouse across mm. the street from the temple, across the road. And you would hear these animals screaming. And I'm like, Holy shit! Yeah, and this time it's it, it, there's unsettling. Go ahead, Glenn. I just I just want to uh, get to the point. Uh, I like when you talk about uh, how aggressive you were uh, raised as a child and how being vegan and vegetarian changed your way of uh, uh, acting out and kind of change you emotionally. Yeah. And I never really had this connection. I always heard about like uh, being compassionate to animals, loving animals, having ethical aspect of it. But I never really uh, interjected and t thought about my own emotions of uh, being yeah. aggressive and you really connected well, it so well, well. Well, you know, one of the things the Rastafarians was the ones who taught me. So Rastafari means Prince of Peace, right? So one mm. of the things that they told me was every second of pain and suffering that that animal endures up to its death you have to experience the karmic reaction to that. Plus, they release an enzyme into the flesh similar to adrenaline, cortisol, whatever, from fear. So when you eat that animal, that's contained throughout the animal. Yeah, a lot of people poo-poo that, but the trauma that stays Listen, in the tissue. Listen, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, I'm not no fucking Birkenstock-wearing, tree-hugging motherfucker. I came out of these streets, shot, stabbed, went to fucking jail. Like, the shit is real. And the thing that took that, it was like this huge weight. I mean, I still run up on a motherfucker, don't get me wrong, just because right. I ate a vegan diet or raw foods or whatever, but Plant -based. it was like, yeah, it, it was just like, I could just feel a change drastically in my anger and, uh, yeah, and it, and it pays off. Now, Vlad, we have some food out here now. You want to explain because John... Uh, has okay, you a, actually uh, eating John's sandwich. Right. He created I, it. I, I and we oh, have, that's my sandwich? Yeah, you. the Triple J. That's Triple J, John Joseph Jackfruit sandwich. So <laughs> he is And so OG, crazy. in my case, means original gangster. Thank <laughs> yeah. you very much. That's what that's so for. He's, so what uh, do we exclusive. have here? We have a, uh, this is a squash soup. This is um, uh, veggie, veggie bowl. Uh, veggie squash ball uh, with um, 
burger party, and this is what John created out of our... Minus the nutritional yeast, I might add. Oh, that's right. <laughs> we gotta uh, get that in So there. yeah, this is greens, brock. This is my standard. You know, I train for Iron Man and stuff like that, so when I need the good recovery meal, it's tofu cubes. Or if they have the lentil chili, I get that on top of brown rice. This is uh, greens, kale, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, chard and broccoli, tahini sauce, which yeah, is people, sesame paste. Yeah, like cops, if you see it. And then usually I just... And you're working on, an, on another book. Yeah, I'm with, doing with a cookbook food. right now. This right. is my fourth book. Uh, it's going to be like the first third of it is like new health shit that's come out and giving light to a lot of why people are having health issues and then the second two-thirds of it is uh is the cookbook that's great now also you're working on a film and we both share the the wisdom of robert mckee talk yes. about how robert mckee has uh made a difference in your life well um so i was writing a film with somebody mm -hmm. and the childhood stuff of the main character was based on what i went through as a kid and uh, in his foster home. So this, the main character was in a foster home, went to prison, took up boxing. It was a boxing film. And uh, I never said like, yo, this is the shit that happened to me. But, uh, you know, using it as reference and having to relive a lot of that shit, it just, br it just opened a lot of old wounds that didn't heal properly. And uh, shit, I sub... You know, I pushed into my deep subconscious, like not wanting to think about it. And, and then we started going to the Robert McKee seminar story. We did that. And, uh, you he know, brought something out of you. Well, you know, I said to him, I go, you know, after the class, because you did you do I the did three the, day? Yeah, yeah. He would always have a cigarette and you'd be able to like ask questions. Yeah. So I waited up. So everybody else, so I didn't, you know, I didn't want to talk in front of nobody else. So I said, hey, you know, Mr. McKee, uh, as far as like the main protagonist uh, suffering abuse as a child, he goes, he goes, just stop right there. He's like, he goes, childhood abuse, ch uh, children abuse is the number one cliche that writers try to use for characters that the audience could give two shits about. They're writing flat characters, and they think, let me throw some sexual abuse or whatever in there, and the audience is gonna have empathy. Bullshit. He goes, the story isn't about what happened to the character, it's about what that character does as a result of those events, and that's... Yeah, and that... Because I was writing the book, Evolution, and I kept skipping like the worst parts out of embarrassment and like you know, so because we get into that's the ego part that yeah, you're, you're running like, away from all the and time. And then Mr. McKee wrote in my book, "Always write the truth," mm. you know, my storybook because he signs it, you know. And then I was like, I struggled with that for like two years of writing the book, not wanting to put that in there. And then I'm like. If I don't put all of the shit, all of it in there, right. then it's an incomplete story. Right, and the truth is important. And now let's go to the PMA effect, which affected my life. But my brother, Keith, who adores you, um, his life is completely turned around from, you know, just a life that was uneasy to a life of purpose. So the PMA effect, let's talk, tell, tell us a little bit about this book. It's an amazing book. Well, it's PMA uh, stands for Positive Mental Attitude. So originally it was uh, Napoleon Hill came, uh, you know, wrote a lot of books on uh, mindset and stuff like that. And HR, when I first met him, they had this song, Attitude, don't care what they may say, we got that attitude, don't care what people may do, yeah, we got that attitude, yeah, we got that PMA, you know? And yeah. I'm like, yo, what the fuck is PMA? He's like, positive mental attitude, like, no matter what, he goes, if you have the right mentality, even boulders in the path will become pebbles you could just kick away. And I was like, wow. Then I sold this manager LSD. Because <laughs> I was in because the Navy. Because you needed some and, cash to be able to. Well, yeah. Well, you know, I was still in the Navy and fucking up. But that shit sat with me. I'm like, you know. So over the years, everything that I've been dealing with, I had a relapse of crack and pills in 88 to 90. Because as, as any addict will tell you, 
you're constantly facing that. You know, well, you that know relapse. what? It, it's what is what does McKee say? True character is only revealed under pressure. The greater the pressure, the greater the revelation of true character. So when my band member and so-called best friend robbed all the tour money in the Crow Mags at the end of the 87 tour, I fucking spun out. I was out for fucking blood. Yeah. And that anger came back and I took it out on myself because I was hanging out with the wrong people at the time. It was something that I worked on for four years here, and now all of a sudden it's gone. Right. And because it's within. Band. It's what's within The music within was you. really, even when I was a kid, no matter what was happening to me, I had this little AM transistor radio. We, we'd be living in a, we had to sleep in the garage, like of this house. They wouldn't even let us in the house. And I would just be under my blanket listening to like WABC, Harry Harrison. Harry and all Harrison. Those. Yeah. <laughs> See, you know, you're my. But music was always a thing that saved my life. I, I said that even on the streets in the 70s. Then I got into punk rock and like the energy and the violent nature because I was attracted not to New Wave. I was attracted to Sex Pistols, Ramones. Right beat the brat with a baseball bat. That's like, right. that's where I was coming from. So, and then Lock Up, it was the same thing. I got the music and then I got to get out and be in a band and I worked so hard. I did everything to make the Cro-Mags happen and then to have somebody stab me in the back like that, I just, I couldn't fucking believe it. And that dichotomy of the tugging, of like, I'm this guy and this is what's deep down inside and here's this incredible... Uh, knowledge and uh, you know thousands and thousands of years of uh, you know uh, I w like sort of the Gita kind Vedic of stuff. Vedic knowledge, yeah. Vedic knowledge. That's, that's the word. But that's the thing is, it's always You're, the material it's, world is full of dualities. They're always battling each other. That's why the Bhagavad Gita says you need to go beyond good and evil, and equipoise then honor, dishonor. The whole thing that he told Arjuna. And he could have spoken Bhagavad Gita anywhere. There's a reason he spoke the Bhagavad Gita on a battlefield, because. facing death. Life is a battle. There's so much, there's so much deep stuff in why it was in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, and the Bhagavad Gita was spoken. Arjuna didn't want to fight his own relatives, the Yadu dynasty, who who were becoming demoniac and doing, killing and everything else. So. Because was, the, they came from that background. That's how they lived. Yeah, That's the only thing they like, knew. He was like, yo, the legend of Bag of Vance was kind of a metaphor for the Bhagavad Gita, that movie. But, you know, I had the, I got tested. Here's this dude. He's supposed to be my friend. He snaked me. Right. Out of the fucking blue. Stole all the fucking money. I had to come back on Christmas, be homeless, like fucking lose everything. And then, and Christmas was always hard for me too because, like, yeah, well, the, my mother left me in this foster home, and like maybe this Christmas one year, the and and she just left us there. So you know, it was it was always a hard time for me to begin with, and then to come home, and then I hooked up with this dude who was a cokehead, and uh, and then later this girl in L.A. model chick and actress, but the dude was like his brothers; they were all the Cuban. Motherfuckers that got put on uh, the boat by Castro, like r straight up Scarface type people. Right. So like, I started hanging out with him and doing blow and then pills and then we went to Florida to his to get out of New York. I had some heat on me from shit mm -hmm. I was doing, and uh, his brother walked in with like three kilos in a fucking backpack, and I'm like, yo, what the fuck? And we start freebasing. And I never free bass before. I was a sniffer. And that just, you know, started like the first hit. He's like, your life's going to change. And they were making these fucking huge balls of, you know, cocaine in the microwave. And just then the thing was, I, I started bogarting on everybody's shit. I became violent on this shit, on the free bass. And I was like doing push-ups and like, I wrote this scene in my movie because I was out of control. And Eddie was like, yo, your boy's a dick. Let's go. So he went to his boy's house, took all the coke, right? Kilos. So I was just smoking the crumbs and whatever. And then Dave was like, yo, you could sleep in Eddie's room. 
So my first experience with Freebase, he had a water bed. It was like this whole fake pimp shit room, mirror ceilings, fucking air glass furniture. And I'm like laying in this water bed. I took a bunch of volumes to try to go to sleep. And I hear this car pulls up outside his window, you know, on the lawn there. It was in Florida, Miami area. Single, like, you know, one of them ranch style houses. And then I hear the door open of the car. And then I hear two bolts of an AR-15, yeah. two AR-15s. <laughs> fucking into the room where I'm at. Everything's exploding. I roll off the fucking bed. The bed explodes. Mm. They did a walk around around the entire fucking house. These two guys got in the car and split. Fucking cops came. And, uh, and then they, they said, where's the drugs? Where's the drugs? I was like, this is during the cocaine shit in Miami if you saw cocaine cowboys. Right, yeah. And here I am, and I'm like, yo, we don't got no drugs. They must have hit the wrong fucking house. And then the cops left, and then later that day, Eddie's like, yo, he calls. You guys got to get the fuck out of there. First, they came back the next morning, and they pulled up. And it was two uh, Cuban cocaine cowboy motherfuckers. Right. And they were like, it turns out Eddie stole three kilos from them uh. and didn't pay for it. So that was a, that's when all the murders were going down in Miami. And I tried to crack a joke and they were like, said some shit in Spanish and he lifted up his shirt. And they, Crazy Dave, the, my, the dude, was like, you better go back inside. They're going to blow your fucking head off. And uh, and then yeah, no we, we had to yeah, we had to leave. What you overcome? That was the first time I smoked freebase, and it went down from there because then I didn't have the freebase. I got into the crack, so I was strong arm robbing all the crack so dealers is, over here. This is where where you were, okay? And uh, look, I at still that. was vegan though. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that. I would be then. fucking up for three days smoking crack, strong arm, and then do wheatgrass shots. Crack <laughs> dealers and wait, and just be like, "Yo, let's go get some wheatgrass." Yeah, that's fine. And I was impressed when you told me once, like, "You see what happened in my life. This is why I have to work much harder than anybody else because and, I have to improve, improve, improve." Yeah. And 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 you know the interesting thing about that is that that part is where you're hiding. And now in your life, you're not hiding anymore. Everything's ah, out. The vulnerability's there. But it's also, it's an amazing to, thing. To get from there to here, well, that's what people don't see. They see me writing books, and I'm competing in Iron Man. I've been on Joe Rogan. I'm doing Rich Roll, doing this, po doing all this positive shit, going to prisons. I'm getting asked to speak at all these events now. But the thing is, they don't see how I got from point A to point B. And, but there you was know a what? lot of motherfucking blood, sweat, and tears, and what is it and like? Fucking breakdowns in that, and you know, uh, to to get to the point. There's a I'm lot at. of stuff that goes on in the world that no one sees the the journey that gets you there. But the good news is because it's not important what other people see all the time. Sometimes it's influential, but it's important for where you are right now. And where you are right now is this beautiful podcast, and yeah. we're happy that you're here. Thank you. It man. means a lot to us. I want to thank our crew. They're terrific. Everyone who works really hard on the show. Of course, up my friend Vlad and John. Thank you so much for being our guests. Hey, let's have and some great food. And what are you up food. to these days? You know, well, I was born in the wagon of a traveling show. My mama used to dance for the money they throw. And that's the story of my life. So I'm Eddie Brill, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Thanks for being here at OG Talk NYC. Hey, thank you.